What's up Smart Homers? My name's Aaron. I created two videos so far on how to use WLED for beginners, but in this video, I'm gonna show you something a little bit more advanced. How to create pixel art using WLED. The basic idea is this, I'm using a WLED controller, an LED matrix, and then using WLED's JSON API to individually control the LEDs using Home Assistant to send the commands. If that sounds a little bit complicated, don't worry, because I'm going to walk you through step by step so you can make awesome pixel art like I did. Okay, so the supplies you're going to need are a controller, an LED matrix, some sort of diffuser, and a power supply. There are other things you may or may not need along the way, so I'm gonna put a list of everything I've used in the description. When I originally started messing around with this project, I used the Atom High Power Controller that I had hanging around because if you've seen from previous videos, you know that I love these things. Since they have screw terminals for supplying power as well as connecting your LED strips, they're super beginner friendly. I eventually changed over to a Node MCU microcontroller, even though it's a little bit more difficult to set up simply because of how small it is. I'll explain a little bit more about why I went this route later on. For the LED matrix, I chose a 16 by 16 WS2812B LED matrix from BTF Lighting, which you can get from Amazon or AliExpress for a decent price. There are also SK6812 LED matrices, but if you want to copy exactly what I've done, you need to get the WS2812B. You also want to be careful because Amazon sells one that's made up of WS2812B Ecos, which I believe use less power but aren't quite as bright. Using these still should be fine, but if you want to copy exact, use the one that I've linked in the description. For a diffuser, the best one I found was a 3D printed option from Thingiverse. There are several there that are decent, but in each case they have a body, a grid or lattice, and a white diffuser. The grid directs the LED light in a single direction, making it look more pixely, and then the diffuser kind of evens out that light and also prevents your eyes from getting hit with the harsh glare of the LED. I tried a few different ones, but settled on the one I'm showing here, and it's linked in the description, because of how well it goes together. I actually ended up modifying it, which I'll show a little bit later, and then I went further than that and I redesigned it myself to fit my needs perfectly. So I'll show that as well, and I'll leave a link to that once I figure out how to add it to Thingiverse. This one has the diffuser and a grid in a single piece, and it's made using two different filament colors. The first three layers are printed in white, and then I pause the print, switch to black filament, and then continue the print. An alternative to 3D printing may be this diffuser box that I found on AliExpress that has a metal body and a translucent diffuser. The diffuser works really well, but it's better used as an abstract wall art diffuser than pixel art. If you want to use this one for pixel art, you're probably going to have to print your own grid that'll fit inside it. If you've never done any 3D printing before and what I've just showed you gives you a little bit of pause, then I'd highly recommend you check out the sponsor of today's video, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning platform that has a ton of different courses that are super useful and would be of interest to engineers and makers like you and I. I recently took a course by a mechanical engineer named Austin Hartley that goes over the basics of 3D printing and shows you that projects like these can be a breeze. Austin goes over different types of 3D printing, where to get printing files, recommended printing gear, machine maintenance, and even fire safety when printing. As part of the Skillshare sponsorship, the first 1,000 people to click the link in the description will get a free one-month trial of Skillshare. If you haven't already tried 3D printing before, this is a great chance to use this one-month free trial to learn a little bit more about it before you jump into this project. Now, back to the video. The last thing we're going to need is a power supply. As I've shown in previous videos, you need to choose your power supply based on the number of LEDs that you have in your setup. In our case, we have a 16 by 16 LED matrix, so that means we have 256 LEDs. WS2812B LED strips use a maximum of 0.06 amps per LED, so with 256 LEDs, you're looking at 15.36 amps for the entire matrix. This means you need a supply that can give you over 15 amps at 5 volts. As I've shown in previous videos, WLED does have a software brightness limiter, so even if you use a power supply that can't supply enough current for your LED strip, 
or in this case LED matrix, WLED still shouldn't let the LEDs go brighter than the maximum allowed. This being said, best practice would obviously be to get a power supply that can handle all of the current that your LED matrix requires. For testing purposes, I'm using an 8 amp power supply, but for permanent use, I'll be using a 15 amp power supply. Before we put all the pieces together, we need to flash the Node MCU controller with WLED software. Before you run away, I just want to let you know that flashing is super simple, and that was the point that I would run away when I was first considering Node MCUs, but it's super easy. The process I'm going to show you should work for a D1 Mini as well as a Node MCU, so if you wanted to do a D1 Mini instead of a Node MCU, you should be okay to follow this guide. To do this, you need to download two things, ESP Home Flasher and the latest version of WLED for the ESP8266 microcontroller. I'll leave links to these two downloads in the description. Next, connect your controller to your PC using a micro USB cable and then run ESP Home Flasher. Click the drop down and select your microcontroller. In my case, it just showed up as a COM port. Next, click the browse button and choose the WLED firmware that you just downloaded. Click flash ESP and wait for it to finish flashing. Now that your controller has WLED flashed onto it and it's still powered by the USB cable, it's gonna start broadcasting a wireless access point. You need to use your phone or PC to connect to that access point, which is gonna have WLED in the name. If it asks for a password, type in 1234. Here you're gonna see the WLED start screen. First, we need to connect your controller to our Wi-Fi network. So click Wi-Fi settings, and then go ahead and put in your Wi-Fi SSID and password. You should also change the MDNS address to something easy to remember. This is an address that you can type into your browser to navigate to the web UI if you forget the IP address of your controller. Also, change the AP name for future connection to the device. If it ever fails to connect to Wi-Fi, it's gonna start broadcasting that AP, and if the AP name is something unique, you'll know which controller has failed to connect to your Wi-Fi. Once you're done, press Save and Connect, and now the device should connect to your Wi-Fi network. At this point, I would recommend that you set the IP address of this controller as a static IP in your router, because we're gonna use this IP address when we're sending commands from Home Assistant. Once that's done, you need to use your browser to navigate to the IP address or the MDNS address of the controller that you just set previously, and there you'll see the user interface of WLED. In the configuration menu, tap LED preferences. You'll see the LED count, but it's not gonna be right, so we'll change that further on down. Check the enable auto brightness limiter, which is the software brightness limiter that I mentioned earlier. You wanna set the maximum current for the maximum that the supply can handle. So if you choose a 15 amp power supply, you can put in 15,000 milliamps in that field. Or if you chose an eight amp power supply, put in 8,000 milliamps. Next, you can set the LED voltage, which is five volts for WS2812B and 2812B Ecos. It should already be set for five volts, so you can just leave it. Head to the hardware setup section and set the LED type and color order. In my case, I would choose WS281X for the type and GRB for the color order. Finally, set the LED count to 256 and then scroll down to the bottom and press the save button. Now you can disconnect the controller from your PC. Now we need to connect the WLED controller to the LED matrix and then we need to connect power to both. Basically, both the Node MCU and the LED matrix require five volts power. And then we need a wire from the Node MCU to the matrix that carries the data for controlling the LEDs. The reason why I chose the Node MCU is because it's small enough to fit into one of these 3D printed cases that we're gonna use. The plan is to solder the Node MCU directly to the back of the matrix, which should keep everything as small as possible. If you look at the Node MCU, you're gonna see a bunch of pins on it. We need to find the V in, ground, and D4 pins. There are actually two ground pins, but you want the one right next to the V in pin. The V in pin needs to be connected to the positive power wire plus five volts. The ground pin needs to be connected to the ground or negative wire. And the D4 pin supplies data and needs to be connected to the data wire on the LED matrix. If you look at the back of the matrix, you're gonna see two sets of wires. The set with the male connector are the wires for the beginning of the series of LEDs and are labeled five volts, ground, and data in. 
what we can do is remove these wires and then solder the node MCU directly to the back of the matrix. Remove all the wires on the back of the matrix, but leave the green data in wire. Once the wires are removed, we need to modify the controller. Flip the controller over and gently bend the V in, ground, and D4 pins outward, away from the center of the controller. Then either cut off completely or gently bend the rest of the pins inward toward the center of the controller. While doing this, you should make sure that no two pins are touching each other. These pins won't be used for the setup, so it's just a quick way of getting them out of the way and also reducing the height of the Note MCU a little bit. What you should have now is the controller with three pins bent outward and the rest bent inward or removed. Now you can solder the VN pin to the plus five volts terminal on the back of the matrix and the ground pin to the ground terminal on the matrix. You may have to do a little gentle twisting of the pins to get them lined up with those terminals on the back of the LED matrix. Next, solder the end of the remaining green data wire to the D4 pin. If you use enough solder, these joints should be pretty solid and will support the weight of the Note MCU so it can just be affixed to the back of the LED strip. If you want to use a little foam tape to secure it better, you can go ahead and do that. Don't copy my soldering technique here because I'm far from expert. Now that we have a controller connected, we need to connect power. To do this, I tried a few different things. I first decided to try one of these two wire DC adapters that has a female barrel connector on the end. I actually modified my 3D printed diffuser housing in order to accommodate this adapter by measuring the adapter, selecting the appropriate drill bit, and drilling a hole in the side of the housing. You have to be careful doing this if you chose the housing I did, but after this you can slip the barrel connector into the hole and then use a zip tie to secure it in place. I decided to try making things a little bit more compact by using a panel mount DC adapter that has a metal nut that secures it to the housing, making it more secure and allowing it to sit flush with the side of the housing. This does require a little bit larger hole, so you have to be careful that you don't drill it in such a way that it not interferes with the LED matrix that's sitting inside the housing. I actually ended up redesigning just the frame of this housing, and I'll put it on Thingiverse when I get a chance. I made it a little bit thicker, and I actually put a hole in there so you can just screw in this panel mount adapter right into the side of the housing, and that nut's not required. Once the adapter is in place, we can go ahead and solder the red positive wire of the adapter to the five volt power injection terminal on the middle of the matrix and the black wire to the ground terminal. This will apply power to the LED matrix and since the controller is attached to the ground and five volts terminals, it's gonna be powered as well. If for some reason your controller doesn't seem to be getting the full voltage it needs, you should solder the red and black wires to the same terminals that the controller is soldered to. You can see as you're assembling that the Node MCU really allows you to get everything in one small compact case. I assembled it so that the two wire adapter points down relative to the matrix, meaning that if I hang this on the wall, the power cord will come from the bottom. Once everything's assembled, we can get into individually addressing the LEDs. WLED has an application programming interface or API using JSON that allows you to send commands over HTTP to your WLED controller. And this can allow you to do quite a few different things. I'll link this documentation in the description. In the documentation, if you click per segment individual LED control in the table of contents, you can see the documentation for sending the proper commands to your controller. Before I show you how to do this in Home Assistant, there are a few things you need to understand about this method of individual LED control. First, this is only gonna allow you to display a single image, no GIFs, and no scrolling text. Second, these pixel assignments are not persistent, meaning that if you turn it off and turn it back on, it's not gonna show up again. Instead, it's gonna go back into the effect mode that it was in before. Third, for these color assignments, for the individual LEDs to apply correctly, the LEDs already have to be on there has to be power to them, and the LEDs also have to be at the brightness that you want them at. Finally, we can only assign individual LED colors to LEDs in a single segment. So you're gonna to wanna to have one single segment for this matrix. Sending these commands via Home Assistant is a little bit complicated. So I'm first gonna show you how to create the command for assigning the colors to the LEDs, and then I'll show you the rest of the command after that. We set individual LEDs in a segment by using the LED index followed by its RGB color array. If you didn't see my last video, every WLED segment starts with an LED ID of zero. So we specify that we're dealing with a segment object that we're using the individual control property, and then I can list each LED index 
followed by the RGB array, where the first number is the brightness of the red, the second is the brightness of the green, and the third is the brightness of the blue LED. So if I wanted to set the first LED to red, the second one to green, and the third one to blue, I'd specify LED index 0 to 255, 0, 0, and then index 1 to 0, 255, 0, and index 3 to 0, 0, 255. If I want to set the color of a group of LEDs, I specify the start LED index and the stop LED index, followed by the color array. Like I showed in my last video, the stop LED is not actually included in the group that you're addressing. To set the first eight LEDs to red, skip two, and then set the next eight to blue, I would have a start index of zero and a stop index of eight for red, and then a start index of nine and a stop index of 17 for blue. I hope this all makes sense, but you're definitely gonna have to play around with it to figure it out. Next, I wanna show you how to send these commands in Home Assistant. These commands can be sent in Home Assistant using a command line switch where the on and off commands of the switch are curl commands. The first part will be the same for every command and you can just copy and paste the code from my GitHub. But you'll need to replace the IP address with the address of your WLED controller. The second part contains that data that you want to send to the controller, the index and color you specify for each LED. I'll put an example of this code on my GitHub so you can see how it works. For the off command, I just send a command that turns off the LEDs. Once you create the command line switch, you can go to developer tools and under YAML configuration reloading, choose command line entities. As a shortcut, you can press the C key, type in reload and click reload command line entities. Doing this should make your switch appear, and anytime you make changes to these switches, which you probably will do a lot, you can just reload them in this way. So, as you can see, these commands can get pretty long and complicated if your art has a lot of different color LEDs. Also, the LEDs in that matrix run in a zigzag pattern, and you have to take that into account when you're creating your art. The question then becomes, how do you create pixel art with a bunch of different colors and also take into account that zigzag pattern? And the answer is not manually. You probably find a better way to do it than I did, but what I did was something that's easiest for me. I created an Excel spreadsheet that has a 16 by 16 matrix of cells to create the pixel art. The cells can be filled with whatever colors you choose in order to make the art, and then a macro and some simple custom functions are used to convert the filled cell colors to RGB values. The LED numbers and the RGB values are concatenated, taking into account the zigzag pattern of the matrix. The concatenated string contains the indices and the RGB values in order, and can be copied and pasted into your command line switch. I also created a small pixel art library in this file, and I'll put a link to this Excel file on my Discord if you're interested. I'm hoping to come up with a better way to create this pixel art and create these commands in the future. Once you've created the code, however you choose to do it, you can paste that into your command line switch. Then just reload the command line entities and you should be good to go. Your awesome pixel art should show up when you switch it on. I've made quite a few of these like I mentioned and they're in that pixel art library, but you now have the 16 by 16 freedom to create whatever you want. Anyway, that's pretty much it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please hit the like button and consider subscribing if you want to see more WLED videos. I have a bunch more coming up and I'm actually planning to look into NeoPixel and some other ways to create pixel art. If you want to support the channel, you can become a member or you can pick up one of my custom t-shirts. If you have any questions or if there's something I missed, feel free to leave them in the comments section. And as always, thanks for watching. See you.